Well, good afternoon, everybody. So I, uh, I intentionally named uh, my presentation Lunch Entertainment because unlike Eric who came in to make sure you have something succinct and objective and useful, you will earn nothing from this. In fact, you will most likely be stupider for actually entertaining this. So um, I'm here, uh, clearly not here to talk about health uh, as I'm fat. Um, so I'm going to present you guys two different options of things I can talk on. Um, my background is a, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've started uh, nine different, ten different tech companies now, um, all in the software space. Uh, and I currently have built a uh, technology platform that does healthcare analytics, which actually more directly answers Kristen's earlier question, which I'll get to. So we could spend all sorts of time talking about regression models and claims analysis, and I can talk through the theory of it. Or we can talk through why healthcare sucks. <laughs> I would prefer this topic because I don't have to think as hard and I can just kind of tell the story. So if it's all right, we'll go with this one. So about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, um, I had a, an IT company and we did what's called managed services. And we were one of the first companies in the country that created a different type of IT delivery model. And historically, back in the 90s, if, if one of your companies had a, a network problem, um, you would call me, I would dispatch a Microsoft engineer, a Cisco engineer, we'd go out, we'd fix your stuff, and we'd send you a nice great big bill. Uh, we'd made a lot of money when your stuff wasn't working, so you were in pain, and I was loving life. Um, that went on for a while until we developed a technology platform where we could actually do analytics on the network and the various components of the network. And what it allowed us to do was build a completely different revenue model around IT delivery. In fact, we got to a point where it was just pure subscription. So now, instead of charging $175 an hour, we were charging you $15 to $20 per employee. Instead of dispatching somebody out to fix it, we were able to fix it remotely. Instead of repairing it when it was broken, we monitored and managed it. We, we kept it going proactively. So all this is going on. I built my company up to we have about 120 employees, about 30 million in revenue. And I get a visit from my, my annual visit from my benefits broker. And I always loved that guy. He'd show up and he'd be like, Mike, oh, it was so hard, but Blue Cross Blue Shield, they wanted to hit you a 22% increase. And I really worked hard for you and I got him down to 12%. I'm like, it's the only guy I ever met that wanted a pat on the back for giving me a 12% increase every single year. <laughs> so I asked him a question, and I said, you know, and I always tell this story, so there's a few of you that heard this, but it, it, it helps establish the light bulb, right? I said, you know, we can predict, we can monitor, we can manage the health of any computer network in the country. We can repair it. We can proactively manage it. Why can't you give me any insight on why I'm getting these healthcare increases. And so I asked a lot of really stupid questions. I said, you know, why don't we get a claims file? Why don't you let me take some, you know, I've got algorithm guys over here and data scientists. Why don't you let us take a crack at figuring out what's going on with our claims file? And again, 12 years ago, he laughed at me. He says, we, we can't get the claims file. And I said, well, we do all the IT for the largest hospital in town. Why don't you go down there and get our doctor records? And he just laughed at me. He goes, oh, you can't do that. And like, I said, so we can't get any insight into, into anything that's driving our risk. And Kristen asked this perfect question, and I paid her five bucks to ask the question. <laughs> After the fact. After the fact. But I was back there high-fiving you and didn't even know it. But I'm, I'm sitting there going, well, she just led to my second option, why healthcare sucks. Because the reality is healthcare sucks because we have not done a very good job. And I say we, I mean globally over the last 50 years of focusing on what healthcare is really about from a consumer's perspective. A lot of us in this room, day to day, we talk about healthcare from an administration, an insurance, a claims, a benefits. Sometimes we don't step back and say, you know, what's in it for the consumer? What's in it for you? So just out of raging curiosity, how many folks in here are on the benefits side? Is it most everybody? Okay. How many folks are employers where they provide benefits? Okay, last question. How many of you have ever been sick? <laughs> okay, so we have healthcare consumers. So 10 years ago, I started asking a lot more questions. I was in an interesting point in time in my company. Um, 
as serial entrepreneurs, we, we tend to sell our companies and we go into what's called earnout periods where you've got two or three years where you just got to stay on board and kind of watch the, watch, the, watch the store go. But during this two-year period of time, I started digging into healthcare and I wanted to really understand it. I'm like, this doesn't make sense to me. And so I started talking to insurance benefits brokers. I started talking to insurance carriers. I started talking to providers. I started talking to doctors. I started talking to wellness coordinators. Health savings arrangements folks. I started talking to all these different folks. I'm like, man, there's a lot going on here in this world of healthcare. I mean, when you think about it, you as a consumer, you just want to go to the doctor. But how do you get that ability to go to the doctor? It's not real easy, all right? So the huge variety of stakeholders we have was one of the early indicators to me that, hey, there's a problem with how we deliver healthcare. The second thing that popped up to me very quickly, um, healthcare, even though they talk about standards, they talk about common data formats, uh, it's not real accessible data, folks. Uh, these systems, a lot of these systems, especially with the large carriers, are very antiquated. Um, they can kick out a data set in one specific format your ability to do a lot of different analysis on those data sets isn't real high. And I would say up until the last you know, four or five years ago, we really didn't have the ability to start to look at multiple different data sets. And think about it from a consumer's perspective. How much information is available to you right now when you want to go out and buy something? You want to buy a TV, right? You can go shop, you can get third party validation, you can see reviews, you can do all this, get, you can get all this different insight into your normal consumer experience. With healthcare, you can't do any of that. There's zero transparency for the most part. And that was one of the critical problems that I started to see. I said, this technology situation we've got where half of our data is at the provider, the other half of our data is over at the payer, who knows what the third party administrator is doing with it. And I'm just like, gosh, gosh we gotta figure out a way to get this, this legacy technology to be more user friendly. The third thing I recognized, and I'm, I was talking to my benefits broker about this, I'm like, how do you get paid? This is not gonna be a popular topic in this room, I'm. <laughs> he says, I get paid commission. I said, so every year when I get a 12% increase, you're getting a pay raise? And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, we're gonna change that. You're going on a consulting fee from here on out. <laughs> and then I started thinking about it. I said, how do these insurance carriers get paid? And then the Affordable Care Act came, at, came out, Affordable Care Act came out and said, you know, there's a cap on how much profit an insurance or how much revenue a carrier can actually have for the administration of claims, and it's capped. So now I start thinking about it, I'm like, how are they gonna get revenue growth if they're capped? They don't have any benefit from efficiency. The reality is they've gotta raise your rates. Then you start to look at how the hospital makes money. And they've got, another, they've got a whole other challenge now that they got high deductible plans and the consumers are paying more and more of it. The reality is hospitals need really sick people to come into their hospital to make their budgets. So when you really think about what a consumer wants from a healthcare perspective, in terms of what the revenue models are designed to do, they're very contradictory. Hospitals, insurance carriers, nobody gets paid when people are healthy. They simply don't. So that's a big part of our problem. Over time, I started doing some research on how did we go from the point in time when a doctor would visit your house and he would show up with his bag or her bag and provide services to you and you'd pay cash. Well, it started to expand and we had this wonderful thing called employee benefits and overall it's helped. It's given us a much higher level of care. But what has happened is over time, as the administration burden has grown, healthcare really has replaced health and insurance. They used to be two separate things. And if you start to think about any other insurance product you have, you don't insure yourselves for oil changes. You don't insure yourselves for radiator belts. You don't insure yourself from some of the day-to-day -day things. But over time, we've merged these two and created this concept of, you know, as I call it, it's a candy store concept. My kids, I got three kids, and we go to this candy store up in northern Minnesota, and I made the mistake one year. I said, kids, have at it. As much as you can carry, have fun. <laughs> and they had stuff falling out. It was, it, was, it was awesome, it was hilarious, it was hilarious, but then I'm like, the clerk's like, how, how, how am I gonna bill you for this? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so anyways, we've got a candy, candy store mentality now with our healthcare. Health and, health and insurance has merged to the point where everything's included and we don't have any personal accountability and that's created part of the dilemma. And James made my head hurt 
today, thank you, we have a lot of government and politics involved in this. And in some cases, it's not necessarily the right government. And what I mean by that, a lot of this, there's some of it that has to be federal, but some of the things that have been happening in the industry, some of the things that I've been seeing with the develop, de development of our platform is local entities, cities, counties are partnering with their hospital providers to create solutions that are superior to anything that the federal government could do for us. And I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into some of the things I'm seeing. I'm seeing it in Minnesota. Wisconsin's crazy. Uh, you guys have a couple medical trusts down here that are, have created employer direct contracts directly with their providers and wrapped insurance around it. There's some fascinating things going on at the local level. Now, it doesn't mean you don't need all the insurance carriers and everything else. It just means you need their products to be delivered to you in a different fashion. But right now, the government and politics is all focused on how do we solve it for everyone when the reality is the communities could probably solve it themselves a hell of a lot more efficiently. And the last piece to the puzzle is our friendly healthcare consumer. The word that I always uh, talk about, and I am a poster child for this, I hate to go to the doctor. Uh, I wait till I get a whole bunch of things going on, and then I go in and I get it all fixed at once. I mean, that's, that's, that's what we do. I mean, it's not the right thing to do. But as a healthcare consumer, I'm contributing to this problem as much as anything else. I don't take care of myself. I don't get treated when I'm sick. I wait for things to get catastrophic. Things that could have been prevented, I put off. Now all of a sudden, I got a big procedure. I got a big cost piece here. The last piece to the puzzle, which once again, Kristen highlighted, is I don't necessarily have the information about my risk factors in a way where I can be provided with enough information to mitigate the risks myself. And that is the direct answer to your question. We have not provided the consumers with enough data and allowed them to make the right choices for their own personal situation. And that will be the theme that you will hear from me the rest of this conversation is that as you're constructing benefits programs, as you're thinking about health and care and insurance, you have to realize every single person that works for you is a different person. They have different challenges, they have different lifestyles, they have different everything. And you have to somehow figure out a way to customize their experience to meet their specific needs. And that is the critical element in solving this part of the problem. So now, maybe, oh, we already talked about that. We don't need to cover that again. I'd like to do a, a reverse exercise. And this is something that literally I've done over 10 years. And it's, it's actually a fascinating exercise. What would healthcare look like if just those of us in this room put together the national policy? Try to throw out, try to throw out a lot of what you know. Same driver discount for your body. That's correct. So from a consumer perspective, if you're doing the right things, you'd get a discount. Or would you get an incentive? Okay. What about choice? Is that a big one? You want to go to whatever doctor you want to go to? How would you know what doctor you'd want to go to? How do you buy a TV? All right? How would you know what options are available to you? Maybe you don't like the answer you got from one doctor. Would you like access to a different set of doctors that maybe have other opinions? Would you want to pay for somebody that was not taking care of themselves and just beating the hell out of the system? It's an honest question. Okay. Would you be willing to pay for people that possibly couldn't take care of themselves? Maybe they have a genetic disease. Maybe they have a disability. Would you be willing to contribute some of your premium towards those individuals? Okay. We've got a strong basis of a health care policy here. Next question for you. From a consumer perspective. In technology, our it's a geek joke, but bear with me. We always say you get better, faster, cheaper, and you can only pick two. It actually applies to healthcare too, okay? But what would you want the technology to do for you if you could invent anything you wanted? What would it do for you? How would you access your doctor? Does anybody access their doctor right now on their phone? I do. 
In fact, I have my doctor and all my specialists on my phone. I like that. What else would you get? What if your doctor wanted to, you to do your blood pressure every, every week? Would you want to go to the office or would you want to be able to do that remotely? Right? What if we found out that your doctor necessarily didn't have to run the test that you need on a fairly consistent basis? What if your doctor could have somebody that makes a little less money do the same tests? It's more efficient for you. We're starting to get better. We're starting to get faster. Now that starts to address cheaper. Okay? Right now on the provider side, they have a workflow problem. A lot of doctors have to do things that mid-levels and others could do. But right now, the doctors have to do it. Moral of the story is the healthcare industry, and I say this in front of rooms full of hospital CFOs and CEOs, from a technology pr perspective, it is the most decrepit industry I've ever seen. It is, it's, it's unbelievable. I've, in 22, 23 years of doing tech stuff, I look at this and I'm like, what is going on? And the biggest part of the problem is everything is siloed. You'll have a great medical device that doesn't necessarily tie to that thing. You'll have an electronic medical record that has nothing to do with what's going on in your lifestyle. You'll have a great wellness and pro program at your employer. None of that data gets up to your doctor. The data is all over the place. The technology is junk. That is a big part of the, the solution for you as the consumer when you can start to see where your data is and what it means to you. Next question. And I, this is a true question. Would you be interested in purchasing the services that you know you need outside of insurance? So for example, I have a child with a peanut allergy. I went to Mexico and we did not have an EpiPen. Would my insurance carrier pay for my EpiPen? Negative, Ghost Rider. <laughs> so I go to my insurance carrier, I'm like, all right, so if my kid has an allergy, we go to a Mexican hospital, that's gonna be a $36,000, $40,000 claim, and we don't cover the $1,500 EpiPen. No, 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 you gotta pick that up in here. Okay. In the past, we did not necessarily have the technology that would allow us to pick and choose the health services we need. But if we can get to a point where your local hospital, your local doctor, a lot of the local resources you have give you the ability to buy some of these services you need without necessarily bundling them into insurance, we've now just created a whole mechanism of choice and customization to meet individual needs. Now it starts to get compelling. This is the most important piece to this. If we can start to get hospitals, carriers, TPAs, and everybody else that benefit from good health, imagine what that would look like. And here's the example I gave last night to the group. Imagine you as a community collectively come together, all the employers come together, the provider comes together, the county, the city, the school systems all come together, and they say, we're gonna do exactly what Mike's just talked about. We're gonna buy some services on our own, we're willing to put some money towards people that need help that can't help themselves, but let's say we collectively as a community do an amazing job of managing our health and on December 15th, everybody is eligible for a health care refund check. Would that start to motivate the community? Would that start to motivate the employees? Would that thinking, that consumerism, where you've had choice, you're, you're still kicking into the greater good, you're still getting insurance when you need it, but now it's individualized to you where you can get part of the community kickback, you can get part of an incentive back for you and your family if you do a great job, and your brokers are still getting paid, and the insurance carriers are still getting paid, everybody's still getting paid, but we've just shifted this revenue model. The stakeholders are still the same, and this is where I start to get a lot of pushback, and 10 years ago when I started talking crazy like this, I was getting kicked out of boardrooms, and well, you're trying to eliminate insurance. I'm like, no, I'm not trying to eliminate insurance. I'm trying to apply it in a different fashion. I'm trying to leverage technology that exists today that didn't exist 20 years ago. You've built a business model on junk technology. You don't need to do that anymore. Now, trying to get Washington to think like that, that's a whole other challenge, and I'm glad I'm not James. But the reality is there's ways for everybody to still get paid and still create a much better experience for the consumer. And I would argue, as you've probably alluded, that the role of government should be more local. Your local hospital has incredible resources. I know I've met with them a couple times. Your city, your county does, but they're, they're not tied together. They're not collective in a way 
that will deliver results to the residents and the consumers. But they can be very simply. So that turned out kind of weird. Um, I'm going to ask you guys next week, the site goes live Monday. Um, this little exercise I've done here, I'm now trying to do on a national basis. And as James indicated, um, for the first time in the 10 years that I've been dealing with this, and I, you know, eight years ago before Obama did Obamacare, I was out lobbying and I was doing all sorts of things. I was saying, hey, there's different ways of doing this. This is the first time I actually think that we as consumers can actually start to dictate what we want in a healthcare bill. So I've had my team set up this website. And I'd ask some of you that are within the industry to become authors and start to offer suggestions on how we can craft it. And the website's going to be broken down by stakeholders. If you're consumers, what is it you want out of healthcare? Just let's put together a series of ideas. And then the goal is we're going to try to communicate with the legislators and let them know that, hey, as consumers, we, we need something a little different than what, what you've got. And I hate to say it, what we've got's not working. And if we repeal without replacing with something, we got a bigger problem. So I think we have the opportunity to actually make a little bit of difference here. So my company is called Benovate. Um, we are designed to help communities build integrated health initiatives. And my name's Mike Ryer, and thank you for spending some time with me.